What what is it that you find uh, in these other parts of you know, Central and South America that you think is potentially useful in that way? It's hard to it's hard to pinpoint, but there's a there's an openness. I mean, they're obviously. I'm not saying that their culture is better than ours. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying that there there. I think that there are seeds there that can be that can be cherry picked and that can help us. Um, and there's a there's an openness. There's a there's a there's a multiplicity. There's a there's a humbleness. There's a, and and somewhere there there's there are grains tools whatever that that can be can be used. Mm. Reading people like Eduardo Cohn and Eduardo Viveiros de Castro sort of gives very good, but even you know going back to Levi Strauss I think is is, mm. is is an excellent. So I think there's there's a lot there in 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 anthropology and there. Because what what becomes incredibly clear is how 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 our own culture sort of funnels our way of seeing the world, mm. and so whatever it is that it takes to to trigger curiosity in people is good. We need that. Mm. We need a lot of curiosity, we need a lot of creativity, we need a lot of, you know, enthusiasm and, and joy for, for doing things because we're up against a lot of <laughs> really scary problems. Mm. How, do you, how do you deal with the, uh, the complexities then of dealing with non-Western cultures and not then falling into a kind of a, you know, kind of a neo-colonialist or a sort of a you know, primitivist kind of track in... Because that's where we're, I suppose, historically speaking, where artists have looked outside of Western culture, you know, early part of the 20th century. Um, there's, there's always been a, 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 an underlying problematic that's, yeah. uh, that comes with that. It is, it is super difficult, huh? Mm. And there's obviously, I mean, there's, there's a lot of skepticism. Mm. There's a lot of skepticism, and and I and I think that with with anything like with anything in in what we're doing, it's a question of building trust. And time is essential for trust. So I think that mm. trying to build bridges over longer period of time, and and also building relationships that are beneficial for everyone involved. Mm. And again, I come back to interdisciplinarity because what is fascinating about interdisciplinary work is that as, as soon as you have a core question that you're all interested in, that, that all ex, that excites everyone, you can, you can do very different things. Mm. And, and, the, and the people who come from different backgrounds will draw very, very different knowledge from that ex same experience. Mm. And so, and so building trust over time and then allowing people to, to learn different things. It's not about, you know, what I learn is more important than somebody else learns, but also seeing that because we're different, being in the same room and, and, and experiencing the same thing does not mean that we, we draw the same thing from it, the same knowledge from it. Mm. Um, but it's super, it's all of, I think all of these things are super, super difficult and it can be super annoying at times. Mm. But um, in the long run, it's, it's so exciting and, and uh, extremely fortunate. I mean, essentially what you're talking about is a kind of a more collaborative approach where you're, what you bring and what is also brought, you know, outside of the discipline and also yeah, from, from different cultures, uh, has to be complementary, and because that's the only way collaboration works, really, where there aren't strong overlaps and strong conflicts in the same areas, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I, th I think so because it's it's. I think that it's also super important to when you go in to say we don't have to agree. It's not about agreeing, you know. Yeah. It's about having shared experiences and and expressing the different points of view and in that respect they also become exercises in democracy mm. because they become oh, okay you see it that way that's fine you know it's like we don't we don't have to agree mm. agreement is not is not uh, a prerequisite for for collaboration i'd say quite the opposite it's it's accepting mm. And also accepting that there are different forms of knowledge. Yeah. Because I think that again, looking at academia, I mean, academia, I think, used to have a quite an open idea about what knowledge is or could be. But with these ideas, with, with this increased focus on control, um, in order to be able to control certain things, you also have to narrow down the uh, how how you define knowledge, which mm. becomes dumbs down the whole thing. Mm. Sadly enough, I think within academia also it's you know being hijacked to some extent by a kind of a innovation economy sort of approach yeah. to to knowledge rather. Yeah. Yeah. How can we make something that's going to sell, as yeah. opposed to you know how do we better understand the world, you know, and that in itself has an intrinsic value. Yeah, and and I like to I uh, one of my friend one of my colleagues um, talked about Alexander Fleming and his mm. discovery of of um, penicillin. We all know the story how he left the petri dishes and went on vacation or whatever and came back. But what we don't, what we tend to not think about was that he threw all his other research aside mm. and said, I'm going to finish, I'm going to focus on this because this is really important. Mm. I, do, I, I don't think that today with the way that it works with research, the research grants that that would work. I'm not saying that the world is the same as it was in the, whatever it was, the late 20s, early 30s, but it's still, it's a, it's a thought experiment, which I think is like, well, you know, if we, we could possibly invent the next um, penicillin today, but would that really happen? Or would the, the, the structure, the control structures around grants and, and financing render that impossible? I think that's a, that's a very, very important question mm -hmm. for humanity to dwell on. Mm. Yeah, and there's less opportunity for that kind of serendipitous sort of. No. Yeah. You know. And that's where, and that's where I think in in art we're incredibly fortunate because we can mm. just sort of say, come in and say, I want to do this, and in the end it became that, and there is still a sort of a, a sense of freedom mm. there, but it's it's again it's it's shrinking because the whole funding system around art becomes more and more politicized and I, mm. I never signed up to become a, a poster boy for the Swedish government or any other government for that matter or the European Union, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to make art, think art, you know, it's mm. not to uh, fill in, uh, you know, lots of prerequisites. Re ideas about political correctness or whatever it is, the flavor of the month among, among politicians. And, and the politics have re very, very real impact on what is shown mm. in museums, in galleries around the world through that, which means that politicians are making art with their feet, so to speak, which is terrifying, I think. Mm. Do you think there's a danger in amongst all of this? Because there has been a, a receding of criticality, I think, and uh, a receding of the theoretical dimension of, uh, of art, I think, since the 1980s. Do you think there's a danger in all of this um, that ultimately, you know, we're making, I say we, because I was once <laughs> an artist, but uh, essentially making luxury goods for, 
you know, wealthy people, and they said, you know, that's that's where when people think of the art world in the same way that they think of the fashion world, they're thinking of that end of it. I I, I I'm extremely wary of 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 kind of generalizations, those kind of sweeping generalizations. I think yeah. that the um, the market controls a far greater part of what's being produced mm. in the in the arts today, but there's also so much more art being produced and shown than in the 80s. Um, so that's I think that people people who really make interesting art and who are engaged in interesting processes, I don't think they're much faced by that. I think that they go anyone who's who's who who does something interesting for themselves and for their community, they basically give a middle finger. They find a way of giving a middle finger to that. And I think in that, I I always come back and think about Caravaggio. I mean, he had to deal with you know with uh, with the Vatican back in the seventeenth century. So I mean, you know, mm. it's there's nothing there's nothing new there, mm. and that sort of gives me hope. Um, Secondly, I had a, another thought, um, but I lost that. Um, yeah, about criticality. Um, there's a there's an interesting short text by uh, Bruno Latour where he talks about sort of criticality running out of steam. Mm. So I think that there's um, there's a kind of a knee jerk criticality which is is not critical but which is dressed up as criticality mm. um, which represents a large part of what we're seeing um, and and basically what Latour says in this in that text is that you have to look at what what is the perspective mm. that people are being critical so it's very easy criticality can can put you in an extremely comfortable position mm. it's easy to say that you know point finger and say um, it should be this way or you know um, but when people are when when people are being critical in a, in a position where it where it it makes their life easier and it makes their life simpler and it it sort of it's a it becomes a shield to mm. to avoid difficult questions then it's just pseudo criticality so it's kind of like a reaffirmation of the and a consolidation of the position from which you're being critical rather than kind of it's basically just saying stuff that we already know so mm. it's not dealing with the unknown in in any way it's not mm. taking any risks it's not proposing anything it's basically sort of just regurgitating what we've already you know what's already been established mm. and in my mind that has nothing to do with real criticality um, the real criticality takes risks, says, I don't know where I'm going with this. Mm. If I knew where I was going with it, I wouldn't, what's the point of doing it? Mm. Um, and I think that that is in minority, but I think that that has always been in minority, but that's where the real creation is. Mm. And so for the people who want to do this kind of lip sync, this kind of knee jerk criticism, let them do it. Mm. But, um, I don't think they're getting anywhere. I don't think that they, it'll be beneficial for them. It's and people who are engaged in a real investigation, they know it. They feel it, mm. and the satisfaction that that people get from a real investigation and sharing that with other people is 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 enough in itself. You don't need the the financial. Uh, gratification but we need to live mm. which is a whole different chapter and it opens a whole different set of questions and yeah and i have to say one of the things that i've actually discovered doing this project and as i said before i've interviewed around about 60 odd artists at this point 
um, and we'll hopefully interview hundreds more. Uh, but one of the things that I have found is that the, the for the vast majority of those artists, pretty much for everyone we get that I've interviewed, there has been always um, a a real faith in the practice being of value and being a, a valuable exploration, and that you know, despite. The, the very visible parts of the art world and the the negative things that you quite easily point out within that that um, at that, that particular level is a very vast and deep kind of band of artists who are uh, in fact producing incredibly interesting incredibly experimental exploratory work you know mm -hmm. right now yeah and and I mean the it's very easy in hindsight to say that, you know, but look at them, they knew what they were doing, but of course they, you know, they were all fumbling in the dark. And I mean, if you look at it, if you go deeper in it, mm. you will see that, you know, anyone from Einstein to, I don't know, who was I, but it's, they're, they don't know what they're doing. Mm. They just have a hunch, and they follow that hunch, and and it and and most of the people who have really contributed with something have also been misunderstood by their own time. And it sounds extremely romantic to say that, but yeah. that's not that's not the point that I'm making. The point yeah. that I'm making is that you, they really deal with the unknown, and and I don't think it matters much whether you're a a researcher or um, uh, or or an artist or an academic. If you're really dealing with the unknown, you know it, and you know that you're going to be wrong. Mm. You know that you're going to be wrong, but hopefully you're going to be right from time to time as well. Mm. Um, but if you don't, if you don't take the risk of being wrong, then you will never contribute with anything either. Mm. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. To me today it's great meeting you here in LA. Uh, Likewise. Your <laughs> there wasn't a lot of modernism in the talk, though. Uh, well, like I said, I dropped the "what was modernism" question, but I can ask you. <laughs> You're like no. Nah. No, but I think I kind of answered it. I mean, I, yeah. it, it's it is it is very much, but it's it's also it's 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 full of. It's full of paradox. I mean, I started making art when it was really at the sort of beginning of the postmodern, and, yeah. and at that time there was a real kind of feeling of yeah, we know what modernism is, and and maybe again that was just my own naivete. But the more, the deeper you go, it's like I, I have no idea what it is. Mm. I mean, you can see it as a chunk of time, but. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff happening before and there's a lot of stuff happening afterwards and how all of those interact. And a lot of complexity within it. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I'm maybe, I, I think that I'm about four years younger than you. Because um, I saw your biography on Okay. So <laughs> I'm 47. But I went to uh, art school in the early 90s. And so yeah. And we knew exactly what modernism was. We knew that was exactly what we didn't. Yeah, exactly. That we weren't about. And we yeah. were all about postmodernism. And, the, you know, postmodernism, and this is hard to believe these days, but it had this kind of sexy glimmer to it mm -hmm. that, uh, yes, we're doing postmodern, but, you know, it makes me cringe now to even think about that. But no, I think that they, I think that there was something also liberating in that because there was a vision, there was a, there was a, a sense that that we could actually change the world, you yeah, know. Yeah. So there was a sense of hope, there was a vision, there was something visionary in that and I and I think that that is I find that a little bit sad today that mm. it's like everyone just agrees that it's all going to go to hell or it's just going to get worse and, and da. Mm. There was I mean there was a sense of that to that kind of uh, you know 80s 90s postmodernism in the sense of you know that kind of end game notion yeah. of yeah. 
uh, the, the that culture has dried up. And uh, I always, when I think back, I think the fascinating thing about that is that was just before um, the advent of the internet. And yeah. before we had no idea what was around the corner. Exactly. And how that would change, uh, not only technology, but just, it really would change society. We had no idea. Yeah. And um, it's almost like there was a kind of a, in terms of the uh, culture and the media, there was a, a, a an I well, in historically, in hindsight, there was a, a staleness that we could only go so far with the kind of media that was predominating at the time mm -hmm. and the way in which that was structuring yeah. society. And, you know, this thing came along and it did change yeah. everything. We couldn't see it. it was yeah. Going to happen. You know? No, and I think that that is, I, I don't think that the future is going to be anywhere is not going to be what we imagine it to be. Yeah. I don't think it ever is. Mm. Um, but I mean, there's also, there's a far bigger sense of urgency, I think, today. Mm. And a sense of... In the 80s, it kind of felt like, yeah, being an artist was an excuse to party and have a good time and uh, do lots of coke. <laughs> but uh, today, it kind of feels like Oh, wait, no. But I don't know, again, is it an age thing or is it, is it an age thing? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I was having a conversation just recently, I think it was with Max actually. And I was going, we, go, we don't actually know any, like, millennial. <laughs> no. Because we don't have children either. Yeah. yeah. So we, we don't know any millennial kids, you know. Yeah. We talk about them as, you know, in this kind of cliche sort of thing about what, yeah. how they respond to the world, but we actually don't know any. No. <laughs> so, yeah. No, and it is, it is fun. We're, we're doing, we're doing some projects now that, that we, are they millennials? Yeah, kind of. Mm. And so, so it's interesting to see, see, uh, it's a it's a very different perspective, huh? Mm. Yeah, but it's fun. It's it's. Uh, I've always loved teaching, and and I don't do it now, and I miss it. But it's it's the it's the other aspect of it, the mm. admin and all of that. Which is just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the control. It's again. It's the everything needs to be controlled. Yeah. The admin that takes you away from actually interacting with the students and you know, doing yeah, exactly. research that yeah. you know, keeps you on the edge. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay, great to meet you. Thanks a lot. Likewise.